So, welcome to this class on uh, neuroscience of human movement. So, this will be an overview class on the motor control system just to provide a review of uh, what has been uh, discussed previously and what will be discussed in future. So, we get a better idea of uh, where we are, what our position is because uh, we are at a crucial stage where you know we have been we have come about 30 40 percent in the syllabus and we need to you know go move forward. So, it is it is worth reviewing. So, in today's class we will talk about neural centers responsible for movements, the most important centers responsible for movements and uh, the contribution of the cortical uh, areas for voluntary uh, movement control. So, uh, the discussion is expected to be slightly more philosophical than the rest of the course for example. So, let us remind ourselves of the situation, what is the situation? The situation is the following, we are interested in studying movements, purposive or otherwise movements made by humans. And how are these movements caused? We said that these movements are caused by skeletal muscles. We described a mechanism of how to do that, how the skeletal muscles perform that, uh, how the skeletal muscles themselves are activated. So, excitation, contraction, coupling, uh, the sliding filament theory, etcetera that we discussed. But how is the mu muscle fiber itself uh, getting activated? We said that is done through alpha motor neurons, we said that that is like um, when we discuss the mechanism of uh, how alpha motor neurons communicate with the muscle fibers, we discuss the case of uh, the neuromuscular junction right. So, these motor neuronal pools where are they located? Let us remember that you know they are located in the spinal cord actually this entire dashed box that is shown here represents spinal cord right. So, the alpha motor neurons are in the spinal cord and uh, there are local circuit neurons that control this uh, the alpha motor neurons and these local circuit neurons also receive information that is sensory in nature. So, this is afferent information is it not and we said this is the efferent information we said where this is where these are located the dorsal and the ventral roots and we discussed the the previous in the previous classes these details right. And let us remember this sensory information did not necessarily come only from the the central sources such as you know vision audition etcetera, but also important sensory information come from the periphery this is proprioception we discuss how that information is coming. The function of muscle spindles the function of uh, uh, Golgi tendon organs this discuss the case of uh, uh, the cutaneous receptors and all those things right. This information somehow modulates the local neuronal circuits which further through some processing minimal or other way some processing control the motor neuronal pool and its excitability ok. Importantly that uh, you know the it is worth noting that the alpha motor neuronal pools do not receive information from the higher centers directly this is not happening ok. What, but uh, what is happening is this right. Information from the motor cortex and brain stem goes to spinal cord and it is the spinal cord that communicates with the alpha motor neuronal pool and further produce causes movement. We discussed this while discussing the case of size principle. We said that motor cortex or the cortex or the brain cannot decide which particular uh, muscles or motor units to recruit right. The brain cannot decide which particular motor units to recruit, it can only de decide other things, but not which specific ones to this. This we discussed uh, the in during the discussion on size principle ok. Importantly information from as, as in the sensory information from the spinal cord reaches to two places we discussed these two cases also one is 
this pathway that is the spino cerebellar pathway. Through this pathway, information reaches the cerebellum and it is processed somehow, and it also goes to the somatosensory cortex. Right. Information reaches to the somatosensory cortex, and through association cortices, it uh, indirectly contributes to the control of movement via the motor cortex and the brainstem. We said, I said that you know. Uh, an area located just anterior to the central sulcus is responsible for the control of movements and we call this area as uh, the primary motor cortex right so this is the primary motor cortex or m1 that means when I, whenever i say primary there is supplementary and there are also uh, you know pre motor cortex. So, their functions will be discussed in future classes. So, what we have learnt so far is at the peripheral level the function of muscles, the function of motor neurons, the function in the spinal cord, the function of uh, sensory information in modulating movements in uh, the that are through the spinal processes and all these things through reflexes through oligosynaptic or polysynaptic reflexes not necessarily monosynaptic all these things we have discussed so far. We have to discuss the important or the crucial role of uh, the primary motor cortex this needs to be discussed in future classes. So, that will form our discussion for the next one or uh, two weeks approximately. So, uh, primary motor cortex and brainstem areas in controlling movements. And it turns out that basal ganglia also contribute to movement these are said their purpose hypothesis to be playing a crucial role in movement selection a heart area of research still these things get uh, you know keep getting updated cerebellum in error correction short term and long term both or in other words adaptations and uh, motor learning. So, these things also we need to learn. So, we will spend some time substantial amount of time discussing the crucial role of basal ganglia in movement selection and uh, what could happen if uh, the basal ganglia is somehow affected or its performance or its uh, or its uh, normal function is somehow compromised. Same with cerebellum, we will discuss the crucial role of cerebellum in uh, movement control and uh, its contribution to learning and what could happen if that is compromised right. So, what we will be focusing on will be this box as in the primary motor cortex, basal ganglia, cerebellum what we will not be focusing on are these the somatosensory cortex and the association cortices we will not be focusing on what we have already done are these whatever is in the dotted box as the spinal systems or the spinal processes we have already done. So, this is the status of the course as of now. So, we have uh, so we will be focusing first on the primary motor cortex in the next few classes followed by basal ganglia followed by cerebellum. At, or we should also discuss what is not mentioned here we should also discuss the role of the premotor areas. Now, these now these play a crucial role in combining information from uh, association cortices and making. Uh, so, it, the this is where the the difference between the cognitive and motor part starts to blur the details we will discuss also. So, this is also something that we need to discuss role how does the cortical area play a role in uh, control of voluntary movement. First of all I could have a causal relationship between the stimulus and the response 
through these arrows. Actually, there is more to that than that to than the simple system that represents, but let us discuss this anyway. Now, let us suppose that you know I decide to pick a ball or a person you know decides to pick an object that is here. Now, we have to see how that is uh, going to be executed. By the way, uh, there need not be a stimulus for making a movement. By the way, uh, this is uh, an object that I have I have to pick up. So, that means, there is a stimulus right, uh, but there can be no stimulus yet some intention to perform a movement. So, I may decide I may have an intention to take a walk or not as the case may be. So, there is an there is an intention. So, there is an internal decision that is made or there is a, I may respond to the environmental so uh, activity. So, there may be something that is happening I may choose to respond to that that is response to a stimulus or I may make uh, make the decision internally. So, that is an intention based uh, movement. So, both 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 can happen and so, so, in the simple case of stimulus driven uh, movements. So, there is a stimulus and there is a system that makes a unified consistent representation of the world somehow. So, this may be this may be called as a model this may be called as a, so at least we have some idea of what this uh, stimulus represents. We, so, it, it is uh, it is consistent with what we know as the physical world it, it cannot be for example, um, some illusion right. Uh, by the way there are some illusion uh, you know cases of illusions also which we are not considering a simple case that is not an illusion right. So, then the there is a, a mental uh, makeup of what is going on or, or a model or some some representation of that uh, stimulus is made by a perception system right. This perception system then leads to a, uh, a decision to to act should we decide to act by the way let us also note that the decision to not act is by itself a decision. I could choose to not act there is a stimulus that is coming I could choose to keep quiet or I could respond I could respond in a number of ways. If I choose to not act by the way that is a decision that is made that is probably performed by a cognitive part of the the brain right and then this information this decision that has been made must be communicated to the part that is uh, going to execute the action right which by itself is uh, you know can and may will be com more complicated that I will discuss next and which will lead to a response. Now, let us remember that you know this represents a very simplistic scheme of what could happen. This has some value in understanding things from a neuropsychological or a cognitive psychology perspective. Right. However, uh, its value stops the moment you get into the details. So, in this kind of science, the de it is the details that matter. So, we need to be you know cautious in interpreting. Uh, data or uh, making decisions based on simplistic models, but this th that does not mean that this model has no value there is some value in this. Also note each of these boxes such as perception, cognition, action could involve its own serial uh, processes. For example, um, you know if we have an intention to make a movement or a stimulus that is driving a movement. Suppose, I have to pick up the object suppose I want to pick up suppose this object is there on the table I want to pick up the object. Now, I have to make a decision about what will be the movement that will be required in the external world right. So, this is sometimes imprecisely called as extrinsic kinematics. So, what that means is that the end point kinematics for example, approximately I think I think that is what is meant here. So, I want to know what is the movement I will be making in the external world, but note the movement that the that my body will have to make need not uh, be so simplistic because 
my body has its own constraints. So, if I have to make that ex movement in the external world, what kind of relative movements do my body parts have to undergo? That is the question. So, in other words, the external movements are actually made possible through movements of uh, or relative movements of body parts with respect to each other is it not? This is what we have been saying from the beginning. So, that means, what giant rotations do I have to make? How by what angle? Uh, maybe it is not so, uh, it is not micromanaged to that level or maybe it is we do not know we will have to discuss that in future classes. At least we need to know which joints to you know activate at least to, uh, at least it is clear that you know there must be some idea of uh, you know if I want to pick up the object with the right uh, hand it is right hand that I that I must be moving not my right leg at least that is at least to some extent it is clear that there must be some decisions that must be made this. So, that if I have to move my right hand what is the joint angle that uh, I will have to make with each of the joints that are involved. So, this is represented by the intrinsic kinematics right. Then this leads to the muscle activation in the kinetics. So, muscle activation is uh, done through it is not so direct as if there is a there is a line there is probably more to that right. So, muscle activation that are responsible that will generate the required forces that will make the joint angle that is required. This leads to the response. Actually, this gives an impression that you know what uh, this is a, a strictly serial organization one follows another uh, so it seems right. Actually, this is not true it is not that you know uh, these elements that are presented here are uh, strictly serial, but rather um, can be you know uh, can happen simultaneously evidence for that claim comes from neurophysiological studies ok. So, this model comes from a psychology background whereas, the current evidence from physiology or neurophysiology data tells us that you know this model is too simplistic to represent what is actually to capture what is actually going on ok. So, the details are missing, but still this has some value we will have to uh, review uh, what value that this has and appreciate it for what it is worth. Okay. So, what have we learnt in today's class? So, we have learnt what are the neural centers responsible for movement we have asserted what we have learnt so far and what we will be learning. We will be looking at uh, primary motor cortex, premotor cortex and cerebellum and basal ganglia in the future classes. We will not be looking at association cortices and the supplementary motor area we have already learnt the spinal processes right and we have seen how cortical areas could contribute to the voluntary control of movement. This could be at multiple levels, this could be at the perceptual level, this could be at the cognitive level, this could be at the motor control level, this could be at the level of transformation of an extrinsic kinematic to an intrinsic kinematics. So, uh, what I have to do in the outside right to achieve what uh, I have to do in the outside world, what are the internal movements that I have to make or what are the movements that my body have to make right that transformation actually there are multiple transformations that need to be made. If that movement by the body has to be made what are the muscles that need to be activated and in which sequence what is the time course of action and all those things. So, the details are important in this kind of sense. So, this is what we have learnt in this class and in future classes from next class onwards we will start with a discussion of primary motor cortex we will start with an historical account of uh, what is going on. So, with this we come to the end of this class thank you very much.